Okay, so hello everyone. Good morning, or for you, I think it's afternoon. Um, I'm going to briefly present the ninth paper in the live series, um, in which I um, looked at uh, a Venus-like exoplanet, or basically Venus as an exoplanet, and um, looked at Venus's mid-infrared emission spectrum, um, and basically as we would observe it with life, and try to characterize Venus's atmosphere from this mid-infrared um, thermal emission spectrum of Venus. You might ask yourself, why Venus? Um, Venus is interesting because it is very similar in size to Earth. Um, it is also at the inner edge of the habitable zone and is an ideal candidate for um, observations with life. However, um, the conditions on Venus are vastly different. And if we would observe such a planet like Venus with life, we would have to be capable of, um, in a first step, of course, um, differentiating such a Venus-like uninhabitable planet from an Earth-like planet. Um, to start off, I would like to briefly um, talk about the third life paper, because um, this is um, the paper where we basically set the base requirements for life. So in this paper, we investigated by studying an Earth-like um, planet around the Sun-like star, what the minimal requirements for life have to be in order to be able to characterize such a planet. And in this study, we found limits for the wavelength coverage for life, which is from at least between 4 to 18.5 micron, because in that range, we have many uh, important absorption features from uh, molecules like water, ozone, CO2, methane, and so on. Um, and then we also found uh, a lower limit on the required spectral resolution, which would be at least 50, um, and also on the signal-to-noise ratio of the acquired spectra, which would be at least 10. However, this first study had several limitations. It was a um, simplified study, and I would like to mention two here, because these are two limitations which we had addressed in the Venus study. The first limitation is that we basically generated the spectrum using an atmosphere model and then ran the retrievals using exactly the same atmosphere model. So it was basically, we put something in and see how well we can get that back out again, which is not how things work in reality because of course, um, the atmosphere models that we use, use in retrievals are a strong simplification of the real underlying atmosphere. Um, just briefly for those of you who do not know what a retrieval is. So the main goal of a retrieval is um, basically what we will get from life is a spectrum of, of Earth or whatever planet. And then we want to infer what the atmosphere looks like from this mid-infrared spectrum. So basically what a retrieval does is it takes a spectrum and provides us with a characterization of the atmosphere, and that is the pressure temperature structure in that atmosphere, and then also what gases are in this atmosphere and how much of each gas is in this atmosphere, ideally. And then the second um, simplification I wanted to uh, mention is that we neglected clouds in this first study, and if you look at this Earth picture over here, you can see that neglecting clouds clearly is a simplification of the problem. So this is why in a first step we turn to Venus, because Venus, of course, is completely covered in clouds, which um, basically obscures the view of the lower atmosphere. So what we did is we, um, uh, again, made a model for Venus's atmosphere, which is very simple. Here on the right, you see Venus, Venus's pressure temperature profile. You see um, that Close to the surface, we reach very high temperatures and very high pressure. So um, the temperature on Venus's surface is roughly 700 Kelvin, and the pressure is 93 bars. And then the other thing we have in Venus's atmosphere is an opaque cloud layer, which I will briefly talk about. Um, and then above this cloud layer, um, the pressure temperature profile is almost isothermal and much more um, temperate than at the surface. So it's around 200 to maybe 250 Kelvin above this cloud there. Um, 
our atmosphere consists mainly of CO2, about 95% CO2, and then there's also some water and carbon monoxide. Some of you may know there is also um, SO2 in Venus's atmosphere. The reason why we didn't put it into our model is because this SO2 uh, or the most part of this SO2 condenses out into the sulfuric acid clouds. Um, then the next thing we put into the atmosphere is this opaque cloud layer of sulfuric acid clouds. And we model the opacity of this cloud layer using Mie scattering. And then we use um, uh, the radiative transfer model Petit-Rattrans to calculate the mid-infrared emission at the top of this atmosphere. So basically what life would measure. Um, then after calculating the spectrum, we use LiveSim um, to generate different um, uh, life observations of this Venus-like exoplanet. So um, these observations cover the wavelength range from 4 to 18.5 micron. We consider two different spectral resolutions, namely 50 and 100. So the, the baseline case and the, uh, and the improved spectrum. And we consider also different signal to noise ratios um, from 10 all the way to 20. Um, and then we run retrievals on this spectrum using two different models. One model is the true model, which basically assumes that there is somewhere in this atmosphere an opaque layer of sulfuric acid clouds. And the other model we tried is a wrong model. And this wrong model um, is basically if we assume that there are no clouds in this atmosphere. So we run um, different retrievals using two different models. And what I'm going to show you now is some very basic results from these retrievals. So the first thing we find, of course, is that we cannot really constrain the surface temperature and the surface pressure for Venus, because of course, um, the, atmos the lower atmosphere in Venus is, is, does not contribute to the mid-infrared emission directly because it is optically, uh, because of this optically thick cloud layer. However, what we managed to find very good constraints on for Venus um, is the equilibrium temperature of the planet and the bond albedo. But that's, this is not really a surprise because we are directly measuring the thermal emission of the planet. Then for the atmospheric gases, we managed to show that um, Venus's atmosphere is CO2 dominated. So uh, that a very large portion of the atmospheric mass comes from CO2. Um, in contrast to Earth, we cannot find water in Venus's atmosphere. This is just because the water features in Venus's spectrum are very, very weak and therefore not detectable at the signal to noise ratios and the resolutions that we consider. And the same holds for carbon monoxide. And these results are independent of the resolution, the signal to noise ratio, and the forward model that we use in the retrieval. So this stuff works for the cloud-free model and um, the, the model with the opaque sulfuric acid clouds. Of course, the, our interpretation of the results would be different depending on the model. So you might ask yourself, well, are there things that depend on the model? And one thing we find that, that sort of depends on the model is, for example, the retrieve planetary radius. And this is what we show here in the figure on the right. I want you to focus on the green histogram which is basically the radius estimate for the cloudy model. So the model with the opaque clouds and the yellow histogram, which is um, the radius estimate for the um, cloud-free model. And you see that for the low resolution and signal to noise cases, actually the cloud-free model yields the better estimate for the radius, whereas if we go to the better spectra, so the higher resolution and higher signal to noise ratio spectra, we see that at this point, the cloudy, the true model starts winning out and the radius estimate we get from the wrong cloud free model starts being wrong. So um, these results do depend on the quality of the spectrum and the model that we choose. And this shows that an inadequate model choice given our spectrum can bias the results. So we need to be very careful um, with the models that we choose for our retrievals. Then very briefly, another question is, can we find evidence for clouds? And this links to the, the radius question. 
Um, and the way we do this is we compare uh, the cloud free model to the cloudy model. So how well do these model uh, models fit the observed spectrum? And what we see here is the result of this comparison. Basically red fields mean that the cloud free model fits the result better. Whereas green fields indicate that the cloudy model um, fits the result better. And what we see here is that for the low resolution and low signal to noise cases, so basically the upper left of this square, the cloud free model is better. And these are also the cases where the cloud free model yields the better radius estimate. And only if we go to very high, the highest resolution and signal to noise cases, so basically resolution 50 or 100 and signal to noise of 20, um, only in these cases can we really infer, or only in these cases, the cloudy model is preferred, and thus we can infer the presence of clouds in, uh, directly infer the presence of clouds in Venus's atmosphere. And these are also the cases where the cloudy model yields significantly better radius estimates than the cloud free model. Yes. So just very briefly to end it off, what are my main take home messages for life from this study? Um, one is that life can easily identify that Venus's atmosphere is CO2 dominated, which is good. So we can, this also means that we can relatively easily differentiate between a Venus-like exoplanet and an Earth-like exoplanet where the atmosphere is not dominated by um, CO2. Um, then life cannot characterize Venus's surface conditions. This is due to this opaque cloud layer. Um, and life has trouble finding these clouds, but we can find evidence for clouds uh, if we go to very high signal to noise ratios, especially. But of course, this means that we need more integration times, so a longer observation. But generally, life could find or could identify this cloud deck in Venus's atmosphere. Okay. This is everything I wanted to tell you, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you.